Hey everyone, before we start, we just want to quickly mention a few ways you can support the show. We put a lot of work into each episode, sometimes up to about 40 hours, between recording, editing, mixing, composing. It's a huge commitment, and we really are just two guys doing this, even though we are starting to hire others to help us take on some of the work. But we don't make any money from the show, so here are a few easy ways you can support the show if you want us to be able to produce these episodes more efficiently and with shorter breaks. We have a soundtrack available on iTunes. It's called Between Us, a Psychotherapy Podcast Original Soundtrack. I know it's a lot of words. We're proud of it, and if you like the vibe of the show, you would like putting it on in the background on a lazy Saturday morning. The second way to support us is to go to patreon.com slash between us and become a supporter. Both ways are really easy and will help us do the thing that we do. Thanks. All right, Professor, you know I hate to be the one to break it to you, but I'm afraid you've lost your touch. Where's your DSM? Uh, yeah. Emotionally stunted eight-year-old my eye. Ah, here's what I'm going through. Phase of life issue. Please, a midlife crisis. It's obvious, really. You know, I'm surprised it didn't occur to me sooner. If someone had called my show with this problem, I'd have diagnosed it inside a minute. And then what would you have done? That depends on the caller. All right. The caller is you. Fine. Hello, Dr. Crane. My problem is that in spite of the life I've built, I feel empty. Ah. Emptiness. The eternal void. If I'm not mistaken, it was John Keats who once wrote... Stalling. Deal with the feelings. Let's run down the Beck Depression inventory. Re-diagnosing. You know what the problem is. The caller feels empty. Go on. Okay. I can suggest certain visualization techniques. He knows them already. Look, if he knows all this, then why is he calling? He told you. Because he's empty. Keep going. Well, uh, sometimes it helps to to write yourself a letter. He's already got himself on the phone. (laughs) But I don't know what he wants. Then why do you keep trying to bury him in psychiatric exercises? Because that's all I have! I'm sorry, caller. I can't help you. This is Between Us. I'm John Totten. It's been a long time since we talked to each other. I'm thinking back to my first conceptualization of the show and what I wanted it to be about. There was a very stark moment where the whole course of my life changed. I had a new private practice that was starting to take up more and more of my time as I phased out of community mental health. I had recently been accepted to several PhD programs. I had picked one, I had paid my deposit, and I was ready to go. And on one Saturday, I was sitting in my backyard, throwing a tennis ball for my dog, thinking about the life that my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, and I had created. I thought about how a PhD would change our lives for the next five years, how I would have to stay working as much, if not more, to pay for it, how we would spend our weekends in separate rooms so that I could get work done. And I realized something about myself. So many endeavors in my life, whether they be artistic or academic or professional, were motivated by many desires, one of which was the desire to love and to be loved. And then I realized that I already had profound love in my life. And my coping skills just hadn't caught up with it yet. I was sitting on the porch in the backyard And I asked myself, do I actually want to go back to school? And the answer was clearly no. Not at all. What I wanted was to spend my weekends with my person and my dog, sitting in the backyard, throwing a tennis ball. I realized that I was sabotaging my happiness by signing up for more schooling. And I wasn't honoring the self that was content with simplicity. So that day, I emailed the school and told them I was willing to forfeit my deposit. I emailed all the professors who had written my recommendations and told them that I appreciated their support, but that I had decided 
that a PhD was no longer a priority for me. But putting something out into the world still was important to me. Being a part of the conversation in our field was still something I wanted. So Mason and I started talking about what we would do, and that's when the podcast was born. This time, for me, with a greater awareness that I wanted to do something for myself, but that earning someone else's approval was also important to me. So I started a show where I would interview people whose work had influenced me, people who were my colleagues, and people who had insight into psychotherapy's role in their own development as people and as artists. If there was a goal, it was to deconstruct any authoritarian stance that might be perceived around what we do. To encounter therapists as people, and to encounter patients as people who are able to provide insight. To shine a light on the intersubjectivity of relationships. To witness that we are all a unique blend of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And that when we bring the blend to each encounter, that something special happens in the in-between. Hence the name of the show. If there was a secondary goal, it was to create some sense of community in a field that can be quite isolating. For the tone of the show, we wanted anything but highfalutin. We were interested in incorporating theory, but our hope was that the educational aspects would be sneaky, that people would listen out of human interest and learn unexpectedly. That aspect has faced some pushback, usually in subtle ways. There are some out there who want to hear us focus on psychoanalytic theory, There are some who want us to teach more about different techniques. There are those who would like us to be a place for learning about literature and new books and ideas. We don't rule any of that out. Obviously, if you listen to the show, you know that those things are here. But it isn't Mason's or my guiding principle. Instead, we want stories and characters. We want stories that grab everyone's attention and characters that you feel comfortable enough to have a glass of wine with, or to cry with, even. The process has not always gone smoothly, but really, what does always go smoothly in life? We've had some angry listeners. We've had plenty of potential guests turn us down. At times, it has felt difficult to stay motivated, but we always come back to the fact that the overwhelming majority of feedback you've given us has been incredibly uplifting and positive. But, like my relationships with the therapy community, my relationship with the show has taken on some ambivalence. It's been over a year since we've posted an episode. I've tried to post little updates here and there, but the truth is that this show has gotten away from me for over a year now. It's been a busy year. I posted our last episode from my honeymoon. There have been all kinds of life changes besides getting married as well. Shortly after the wedding, I began a teaching position, and that has taken up a lot of my extracurricular energy outside my practice. And there have been practical reasons I've been slowed down. Most of our interviews have historically taken place in my kitchen, which is currently being remodeled. And to tell someone that I've been unable to do interviews because my kitchen is being remodeled, that statement is so banal, it almost seems provocative. I don't feel like I can tell that to other therapists because I might see the gleam in their eye, the one that means they are seeing the layers. That my kitchen being stripped down to its bones is how I feel like my mind has been stripped down to the bones. And they wouldn't be wrong, necessarily. My mind has been stripped down to the bones. Work, patients, traffic, my wife, my dog. I've caused three fender benders in the last calendar year after going all of my adult life without any traffic incidents. I wasn't even looking at my phone or looking away. I just wasn't present. So no, It's not that those therapists that are always looking for the other layers, even in our social interactions, would be wrong. It's just that I haven't liked them that much lately. Oh yeah, the title of the episode. 
I've decided since I last talked to you that I don't really like therapists that much. I mean, I do. I really do. And also, I really don't. I know it's a weird thing to say as someone who hosts a podcast where I interview other therapists. And I really, really like the people I've talked to on the show. I love them. Ro, Doug, Jonathan, Sally, Roy, Liana. These people are people that I love, and I hope to bring on more of my friends and colleagues in the future. I like therapists, but I also don't like therapists. And I don't know if I can explain it. There are a few therapists that I hang out with where we can easily slip into the mode of just being people, and I don't have to feel like I'm on the clock. It's not about the material we are discussing. It's about the mode through which we are communicating. Often it is about work. I love to talk about my job to a friend who is a colleague, but who can talk about work with me not as if we are consulting. But a lot of times when I am around other therapists, it feels like we have to speak the language, and it's the only language we can speak, and there is an uptightness in the air about whether we are speaking that language or not. Let's say I have a patient who hasn't paid their bill, which, for the record, I don't. And my friend says, how's work? And I say, I'm just really frustrated. I can't get this patient to pay their bill. They will inevitably ask me about the enactment that is taking place and the counter transference and the transferences. And that's fine. That's what we're trained to do. And that's what shop talk is. But sometimes it's nice just to hear back, oof, that sucks. Maybe I'm asking too much here. I don't just wish we could talk in a more proletariat way when we're hanging out on Friday night. I wish we could when we're in the consulting room on Monday morning. I guess the danger there, and maybe this is a fear, is that we relax what we are actually doing as a service to our patients, and we become lazy. I don't feel that tension. I know that my mind and my kitchen are constantly in sync. I know that if my patient is skipping out on his bill, then there is something else going on. A thing is never just that thing. I get it. But I want to engage with it as if it is, while knowing that it isn't. This says more about my psychology than anything else, but I would like to keep the skin of an interaction on when I'm not practicing. All right, all right. I'm, I'm getting ranty and complainy. I put this question out to our listeners who are therapists. Do you like hanging out with other therapists? I honestly want to know. And I know not all of our listeners are therapists, but out of the thousands of listens our requests have had so far, we've had three responses. Three! Come on, therapist. Why don't we want to be real? Why don't we want to be vulnerable? I know in community mental health clinics, the other therapist and I would more commonly get real with each other. Now I'm in private practice, and I see the other therapist I like so rarely. Maybe this is an expression of grief. Over the summer, my friend Ro Reyes, who was featured in our first episode, departed from Seattle and moved to L.A. with his family. In fact, if you're in L.A. and you need a therapist, he's the best, so you should look him up. I love Ro, and hanging out with him doesn't feel like work to me. So maybe I'm just grieving. I put it out to other therapists because I wanted to hear if they agreed. And while the responses were not plentiful, they did echo some of my sentiments. Here they are. Hi, this is Lale. One of the main reasons that I struggle at times are it depends it depends on the, the context. The you know, are we at a party, a, a networking event or something. So often I just, I just want to, to be myself. I don't want to pretend I know a lot of fancy theories about therapy and, you know, it's not a competition for me. But what I, what I struggle with is, is when some therapists can only seem to talk about therapy or their clients or the struggles they're having or something, if, if that's the entire <laughs> conversation. 
I struggle with that because I don't know. I I actually purposefully don't go to networking events and those kinds of things because like I don't I don't necessarily want to talk about my work. Yeah, I want to talk about something else. You know, what what do I do for fun or how do I keep up with my two year old or you know <laughs> like that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think it makes it hard for me at least when when there's some people who are just so, so focused on their work and, and, and I, and I have noticed it's, it's people who are more full-time in the, in the field. You know, right now I'm only working two days a week in private practice. And so I have the luxury and the privilege to not constantly be thinking about work related things um, and therapy type stuff. It's, it's like, okay, what clients do I see today? get my paperwork in, you know, submit stuff to insurance and let me, let me go be with my family. And so, yeah, I think that's, I think that's part of it uh, for me at least is just when, when others are, are so focused on their, their practice or their work. The other thing that I struggle with is also if another therapist or someone in the field asks me like a really, I don't know, deep profound question, <laughs> um, either, either like, you know, about myself personally or about my practice or something. And, and I just, and I just don't feel like it's the right context to ask that question or to answer it rather. And I have said, you know, like, you know, I, I'd be happy to answer that question if maybe over coffee, but not in like a crowded room full of other people and that sort of thing. So yeah, I think I think there can be a tendency for for us therapists to just, in some ways, struggle to take off the therapist hat to want to just dive deep with whoever, and especially if it's another therapist, we're like, oh well, you surely you understand and you want to go deep as well. And really, I I don't, <laughs> I don't most of the time, because yeah, there's there's a time and space for that, and it's generally not in social gatherings. Hey, John, it's Andrew. Uh, I just want to first off say I really love uh, your podcast. I really, I really, really enjoyed uh, the interviews um, and the perspectives and really the, the depth and uh, human humility, I guess, uh, that is brought to these, to these encounters. Um, and I really enjoy being a, a part of them um, and really believe you and, and, your, and your partners do some wonderful work. And, I, and I'm excited to see what, uh, what the future holds. I think uh, the question is a, is a very difficult question. You know, and I find myself, I've, I think I've re-recorded myself at least 15, 20 times because I'm worried that I'm being perceived um, or worried about what, how, what people might think or, you know, and, and then am I saying things in a clear way and am I going to be understood? And, you know, and I really think that, that there's a lot of overlay between even just this brief uh, difficulty that I'm having and my struggles relating to other people in my profession. I work at a, uh, a large, I'm a psychologist at a, a large uh, hospital that specializes in serving veterans in the Midwest. And I find that I am the only uh, psychologist and a staff of around 30 that really has a certain theoretical lens. I do find myself more of a analytic um, lens and uh, plan on pursuing training at my earliest convenience and I and I find that in this setting that perspective really isn't valued um, or seen as as important in a lot of ways uh, especially by my uh, psychology colleagues I mean it, 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 there's the the idea of uh, manualized treatment as being the standard uh, for every person that we serve and and, and that's not something that I prescribe to or believe is, is valued um, or valuable for everybody that comes in. And so I really do take that more contemporary relational perspective. And I find myself even in team meetings or even socializing after team meetings, I kind of find myself running to run away. Uh, and, I, and I do find that I, I am very uncomfortable at times with my colleagues, not knowing how you know, if I'm being judged or that kind of that fear of judgment or 
uh, you know, just it's really weird. You know, I do find myself maybe actually relating more uh, and more easily and more freely with my social work colleagues um, as opposed to, you know, the, my psychologist or even psychiatrist colleagues. But what, what I find has been helpful, actually, though, is is having designated either consult time with another therapist, uh, either like a, I, I consult with a former coworker. Um, and, you know, we have similar but different, you know, theoretical backgrounds. It's, it's similar enough to where we don't drive each other crazy, but different enough to where we're getting unique perspectives as well. That's very helpful for me, um, just to have even that one person every other week talking on the phone and just either talking directly about clients or general, just like, what's it like to, to be a therapist right now? I mean, that's not really socializing, but in some ways it, it turns social, you know, and I, and I appreciate that and value that still. I've always kind of been more alone and I've always really struggled and not only just with my colleagues, but relating to people outside of a therapy context. Um, cause it, how do you, in a lot of ways, like, how do you talk to people without, um, having that lens, that therapist lens at times? And I think that there's a lot of that that fear of being perceived or what what people think of us or our colleagues or, you know, and I think there's a lot of our own stigma. You know, we, we very much talk about stigma as being a, a barrier for our patients, but I think it's a, there's a stigma related to talking and talking with our colleagues and, and relating to them. And I think that really can influence people and make it difficult at least i i I know that does for me because you know i am worried about how people perceive me or what they think this is carlos so one reason i have a hard time socializing with therapists is i can get confused by the interactions it's probably related to the conflict i have about getting close my own wonder When I'm interacting with people, am I networking? Am I socializing? I think that's one example. I'm also an educator, so I have this lived appreciation for the variety of personalities um, of those people who become therapists. So I think I'm afraid that I'll accidentally discover something about someone's psyche. And then since we're in the same field, we'll know the same things. And then there's the possibility of the threat of being envious and feeling insecure. So I guess the bottom line is I, I know I have issues, but um, just give me a minute. I'll get to them. Hearing those answers makes me a little bit less salty. All of those people are really nice, and we're really grateful for your submissions. Thanks for listening to the first episode of our third season. It was a little bit different. You might be hearing a lot more from me this season. I'm always conscious of making sure this doesn't just become the John Totten show, because frankly, you don't want to hear that, and neither do I. But we're getting deeper. There are guests this season who really turn the microphone back on me. There are guests this season who get into the weeds with me. And running through all the conversations, you'll hear a thread. And it's my own frustrations with both myself and my field. If you're into that kind of thing, then buckle up. We also have some renowned and respected and brilliant guests, really. And to balance out all that Johnness, we're driving further into alterity and giving the microphone to women for the rest of the season. Or at least we're trying. Between Us is produced by myself and Mason Neely, who also compose our music. Find our soundtrack on iTunes, and if you want to support the show, go to patreon.com slash between us and become a supporter. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And until next time, take care. <laughs>